Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of AWP, the Anything Wrestling Podcast. Thank you once again for joining us on another quarantine edition of the podcast. I'm back here today with the entire crew. Got a very unique episode, one that I don't think we've ever really done before or come close to doing. Before we get to the subject matter at hand, guys, how we doing? Amazing, perfect. Kamish? I am doing exceptionally well. Today's episode is actually an idea that sort of came up in a phone conversation, kind of unintentionally. Uh, myself and the commish were having a phone call. We were talking just about WWE. Obviously, it's something that we are passionate about and we enjoy watching sometimes. Um, and the idea kind of came up of... Because up until now, you know, we always do previews, reviews, thoughts, sentiments about a particular angle. For example, oh, on today's card, we have this match. What do we think? And I thought that it was time for us to strip away the gimmicks, strip away all the catchphrases and the puns and everything that we usually do. Stripping away the gimmicks, talking as people. Yes, talking as people. Um, not as analysts, not as like unbiased, you know, counter devil's advocates. We're gonna we're gonna stray away from the whole devil's advocate being fair thing, and we're gonna focus on speaking from the heart and how we we as individuals feel about because the current state of how things are going. Because if you guys don't know by now, there comes a time at one point you, you gotta really shoot from the hip and tell you just let it out just just really let out what's going on and how do you feel about it you can't just like oh yeah well the product is great no it's not let's be real yeah um not to not to say we won't draw from things that we know or that we've heard but we're gonna speak unencumbered (laughs) yeah um Essentially speaking as long-time wrestling fans, because fair to say that all of us have gone through different eras of wrestling, and it's kind of brought us to this point, and I just feel like for the first time, while we're in quarantine and have had a lot of time to think about things, we need to come out, come out with it and express how we truly feel about the WWE product that's being put out. So... And I've told the guys, you can talk about anything. You don't have to shy away from anything. There's no restrictions. Just speak from the heart, whatever you're feeling. If you want to draw back to a certain storyline, event, pay-per-view, superstar, what have you, it's all fair game. So with that said, let's get started. Anybody want to go first? (laughs) Well, speaking as a fan, I feel like I'm obligated to uh, to let you guys know that I have been sipping wine uh, leading up to this recording session, so uh, I'm a little relaxed. Which is exactly but, how we would want you to be. <laughs> um, so okay, so pretty much, I'm going to start by saying that the way that th- I, I I think that WWE has missed the mark with a lot of this pre-taped and even live at the performance center are they at the performance center right now i believe so like are they are they back there i think so um i i just i don't think that it, it's packing the same punch as live shows in front of audiences and maybe that's what's missing is the people so it's it's unfortunate but a lot of these storylines are kind of drab. I, I read this morning that both Kevin Owens and Jay Uso are injured um, from WrestleMania. WrestleMania. Um, and so, like, you've got talent on the shelf. You've got the. I, I, I have a. I have mixed feelings as a fan about the lax nature of these sessions because on one side you don't have the same pressure uh of performing it, it, I'm, okay i'll speak as an actor in that regard 
they're basically in rehearsal right now. They they can do like it's still live, but as I think some of it's live. They were doing pre-recorded there for a minute, but there's no audience there. They don't need to to really dedicate themselves as severely as they normally would. So they get to be a little more relaxed. They get to show a little bit more of the, their in their internal personality than they would on a normal day. But there's been a lot of trash segments. Um, Forgotten Sons is the fact that there's no audience. I don't have a built-in relationship with them from NXT. And uh, I just don't think that a lot of the bookings had the heart behind it. I think a, a lot... I read an article that said that Vince is in sort of a fuck it mode. And so that's part of why he did, he, he came out for the Triple H thing and he seemed a little all over the place and a little spacey and some of his stuff didn't make any sense. Um, and then also with the, the Fire, Fire, Firefly Funhouse match, he didn't really understand the match, but he just sort of shrugged it off. Not to mention... I'm, assu- I'm, I'm assuming both of you guys are aware of this. There's been rumors going around that Vincent Kennedy McMahon may be looking to sell off the company here soon. Yes. You don't know how much. I don't know how much stock there is in these rumors, but we'll see soon enough, I'm sure. Um, but if if he's on, if if he, it's sort of the same concept as somebody who's just put their two weeks in at a job. How much effort do you really expect them to put in by the end of that two weeks? So it just seems like a lot of the stuff go- that, that, that's going on is a little lazy, and the efforts being be- being put in elsewhere just not in the storytelling. Yeah. Um. So I so I miss the I miss the days of having having fans there and having writers and people like Triple H and that sort of that sort of person who 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 cares and wants to put out good storytelling and good programming. Because we're just not there right now. Let's just say this ne- this pandemic never happened. Yeah. Would you still feel the same way? Do you? Think I don't know. That, that everything would still go in the direction that it's going because it does seem like you can kind of see it. Like it used to be, we always would say this on episodes. Oh, they're just throwing shit on the wall, and you know, whatever sticks, we go with. But um, it kind of feels like everybody's now in that mode. I, I think we would have. I think we, it would have taken longer to get to where we're at right now. But I don't. I, I think they still would have. Somebody would have been putting in more effort behind the scenes if there were live audiences and the money. I mean, granted, a lot of these shows are, are the tickets are sold well in advance, so it's not like somebody who shows up on what day are we on. It's not like somebody who shows up tomorrow um, didn't buy the ticket two, three months ago. So you already got those people's money. But when you have a live audience that you need to keep engaged, I think that's the big thing. Is If you have a live audience and you're not entertaining them, uh, you're going to get things like the CM Punk chants, this is boring chants, that sort of stuff. And it's like I feel like it's been a while since we heard any of those. Um, but I think right now, if we had like if to- if tomorrow they funneled in five hundred people, <laughs> I feel like we would hear all of those chants on the show. Yeah, um, Kamish, I'll ask. I'll answer your question, but I'm probably gonna have to jump in because I have some key points here that I actually want to. Brands forth. So you're. I I just want to clarify. You were asking if there was no pandemic, would we be getting almost basically the same thing? Going back to Dan's point, nonsensical yeah. stuff. Okay. Um. I'm gonna say yes. Pandemic or no pandemic, I'm gonna have to say yes. And the reason why I say that is because, from the moment that we conceived the idea of doing this episode to now. 
I sort of had to go back and I had to think to myself, think to myself, what do I really think about the product? How have I been feeling recently? And I got to say, in my personal opinion, I feel like the company has hit a very new low point and it has nothing to do with the pandemic. I'm not talking about, oh, since two months ago, they were on fire and now all of a sudden the, pr the product is crap. Um, I just feel like as of recent, and when I mean recent, I mean over the last few years, it's just something has been missing. I feel like the fire in them to give you a good product, to give you a good story has been extinguished. There, there's no passion is what you're saying. Yeah, I often feel like what they're instead trying to do is insult the viewer's intelligence. They will give you a segment on Monday and ne and then the following Monday, they will never ever mention it again. I, I do want to chime in for two seconds. Yeah. And I want to say that I do think that the social distancing aspect of the pandemic is also playing into the extremeness of why things are so flaky and limited because... They're trying to, to put out these individual episodes using all of six people, and that's why it seems really uh, poorly planned out and garbagey, because you can only develop so much story with six people. But go ahead. Yeah, but I mean, Dan, to counter that for just one second, would you argue that even before there was a pandemic, we were getting dodgy segments as well? We were getting forgettable moments in the TV show that wouldn't be mentioned a week or so afterwards? Oh, absolutely. No, I just mean, I think that the pandemic escalated us getting to the point that we're at now. I think that yeah. things would have continued to, to gradually decline since WrestleMania. Um, so, I mean, WrestleMania was still within this pandemic thing. I think we would have continued to see a decline uh, as if business was as normal, I just don't think we'd be as shoddy as we are right now. And that's fair. That's a hundred percent fair. But personally, I'm gonna I'm gonna really get into personal mode here and say that honestly, I feel like the product now is every single thing garbage. No, is most of it garbage? Yes. And I know somebody would be arguing, well, if it's mostly garbage, why are you still watching? Just you know, tune into something else. And I, and I want to bring this up, and this is maybe the first time that I've ever said this, and I hope you guys are okay with me sort of bringing this up. Uh, you, Dan, and you, Kamish, fair to say that you guys split your time, your passion into WWE and football. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, I can't disagree. And the thing with me is that I don't have a secondary thing to tune into. Not because I don't want to, but wrestling essentially is my go-to. It's my happy place. It's what I love. A lot of people get amazed. Oh, you don't follow basketball, football, soccer, tennis, anything. It's just wrestling. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. It's my life. It's my go-to. If I'm in a funk, I could turn on a clip and it can make me laugh and get me away from my trouble. At the end of the day, I want what's best for the WWE. I really, really do. If I didn't, I would be like, yeah, the product sucks, and eh, let's just let's tune into something else. But I want what's best for it. And in my, in my eyes, I feel like this pandemic actually serves as a very good opportunity. I know they pride themselves on, oh, we are no off-seasons. We never take a season off. We're always going, going, going. I think that now would be a perfect opportunity for them to apply the brakes. You can have weekly television, maybe throw in some retro moments here and there to kind of fill up, you know, moments of the or, you know, segments of the TV program. But I feel like now more than ever would be a good idea of, hey, you know what, guys, we didn't see this coming. There's a pandemic going on. Let's allow for most of the guys and girls to go home, catch their rest recharge their batteries. Once we feel like slowly the world is up and running, we can let everybody back in. In the meantime, maybe we have to rethink about the people who are on our creative team. Maybe we have to rethink about the people who are in charge and just sort of spice things up, allow for some change to flow in through the company. Because I've said it before, and this is me, tr I'm trying to not insult anybody, but when you have Joe, who has graduated from university two years ago, wrote for one or two soap operas, 
now all of a sudden is the head writer of WWE, and he himself in a video goes, oh, I've never wrote for any wrestling associated company. I just, I did TV and that's it. And I was offered this job and here I am. And it's like, whoop de doo that's 100% great for you, but it's not really serving any just justice because look at the product. And I'm gonna, and I apologize guys, this might be a bit extensive. I'm gonna try to go through it as rapidly as I can. But I wanna bring up a few points here. Things that just agitate me, aggravate me, and it's things that are that was right in front of their faces had they only capitalized on it. First thing here was uh, Daniel Bryan's last minute insertion into WrestleMania 30. The fact that in the Royal Rumble, he was not even in the match, and it took literally crowds, arenas, week after week to tell you with their chance, with with everything in their passion that, hey, Daniel Bryan is the guy that we want to see in that spotlight. Yet, for whatever reason, WWE, specifically Vince McMahon, was very consistent on, oh, they want to see Batista versus Orton, which literally makes no sense. Um, case number two. We've talked about this before. I'm going to mention her because, I again, we're not doing gimmicks. Charlotte and Asuka coming full circle. Having Asuka lose, that was okay. But going back to your point, Dan, as long as it had come full circle and you could have wrote this thing as in Asuka is going through a downward spiral, she's lost her mojo since that loss to Charlotte, how can she capitalize? And you throw in a road to WrestleMania and you have a part two where Asuka comes back better than ever and revenges that loss. Something that was right in front of their faces, but they had other plans. Um, point number three. And this is a big one for me. Spending money on a new, almost Proving Grounds-esque show instead of other entities. What I mean by that. WWE now wants to release 2025 superstars and agents because, oh, this pandemic is going on. We have to save money. There's not enough budget. Let's, let's let some people go in the middle of a pandemic where everybody's job is at risk. Yet, places like Saudi Arabia gets their money in. Places like Fox gets their money in. Places like the XFL, who they just filed bankruptcy for, gets its money in. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, if you were very passionate about finding the next crop of talent, what you could do, and just a suggestion, you could take main event on Wednesdays, you can take that um, WWE Superstar program on Thursdays, maybe converge those two together and almost have a proving grounds show where you take talent whom you're not utilizing and go, you know what, if you think that you deserve more than you're getting... Why don't you show up on this Proving Ground show that we have and stand out, change your gimmick, change the way you talk, do something flashy in the ring, let us notice you, we're going to be watching with close eyes. And you can have exclusive agents putting and operating that thing together, almost like an FCW-esque type of deal. Um, the other thing here is the whole thing of SmackDown moving to Fox and they decided to capitalize on Cain, Cain Velasquez being their last segment after... Kofi Kingston loses the championship in eight seconds. To me, that's, that's two strikes right there. Poor Kofi Kingston, who for 11 years was one of your hardest workers, finally gets the championship. You have no long-term plans for him. You put him in a forgettable feud with Randy Orton, which should have been uh, your, your, your moment to cap off that title reign. And then you just have him lose to Lesnar just so that you can go to Saudi, have him defeat Cain Velasquez, and Cain Velasquez just got released a few days ago which made no, no sense. Um, main event caliber performers, Sami Zayn, Cesaro, Shinsuke, being relegated to a tag team. If you let these guys just branch out on their own, they can become the pillar of both Raw and SmackDown. And the fact that they haven't pulled the trigger is, is beyond me. Um, gonna mention this very, very quick. Uh, they decide to okay and put the green light on people like Ronda Rousey coming in and getting a full title run and being pushed. And Sasha and Bailey have still not, not had their, their main event feud, their main event program, um, or their main roster program, sorry. Um, you have stuff like Kurt Angle's last match, where basic thugonomics John Cena was right there in the building, yet you still decide to go with Baron Corbin, and that was also another case of the fans telling you, that's not what we want to see for the last match. There was another perfect opportunity for you to come full circle. Um, 
Braun Strowman's career is another one. Title reign after title reign uh, gets taken away from him. He finally gets it, but that's only due to circumstance when they book themselves into a corner two or three times and they had to rebook it. Um, Becky Lynch's man run, the whole thing about we wanted to see Becky versus Ronda at Mania, but yet Charlotte, for whatever reason, because she's got to be there, gets equated into the whole thing. And my very last point is their lack of going off of natural crowd reaction. You have, you know, they, I, I'll never forget where uh, Vince McMahon said, oh, people like Cesaro have to get over with the crowd first. You have people like Rusev who were, who has, the poor guy was booked into meaningless things. Being in a tag team with Shinsuke, being uh, Aiden English, being his manager. The, their whole Rusev thing takes off and for whatever reason, they don't capitalize on it. So what I'm trying to say by going through all these points one by one is just the fact that there are some things that's right in front of their eyes and they don't they decide to not take advantage of it. And it's very, very frustrating when you can have good television, yet you decide to have garbage matches, meaningless storylines, fillers, etc., etc., etc. So this is just me. This is Sean talking. Honestly, the product, most of it is garbage, and they can be doing a whole lot better. It's just they decide to invest their time into not what makes a good program anymore, but what makes money, period. Those are my sentiments. Yeah, it's, it's running an exclusively, exclusively like a business instead of treating it like a storytelling medium. Yeah. You're not approaching it like a like a, a movie studio or a, or even uh, like a TV station, a CW, uh, USA, a TNT. You're just treating it like a cash cow. And that's not conducive, and that's not what wrestling fans have wanted. We want stories. We want characters that we care about. And we want the people that we care about to be treated well, because it's escapism. You don't watch wrestling to watch the heel win. You, you watch wrestling to watch your favorites and the good guys triumph over evil. Yes. And if you've got this lazy booking and this 50-50 booking, then more often than not, you get situations like the the Daniel Bryan at 30. If Daniel Bryan had gotten to be in the main event, that WrestleMania would go down as the worst WrestleMania ever. Yeah. For two reasons. For two reasons, mind you. But... That would have been one of them. So it's the fact that for a business, especially since we, we come back to this frequently enough, when they came out and they said, we're going to start listening to you guys, that was apparently a crock of shit. Yeah. They try to enjoy something that obviously everyone will tell me, oh, it's fake. It's not real. It's like, okay, shut the fuck up. I don't care about your opinion in regards to telling me what is real, what's fake, whatever. I know it's scripted. I know the outcomes are scripted. The stories are scripted, whatever. The sport itself is not. Yeah. These guys don't train to look the way they look and not get hurt. What bugs me is I feel like the company has put their money into way too many investments that have not panned out. So it was like, oh, well, this didn't work, so we got to trim this part of the company to make it better or to save money, regardless of the pandemic or not. Like, my thing is, it's like, why do you grab talent either from the independent circuit or from your competitors and you run them to the ground? You saw something in them to steal them from their other company. And then you don't do shit with them. Why? Like, it, it, is it, Do you really want to bury someone that bad because they're doing so well somewhere else? Or do you just, do you just honestly not try? Like as writers, as producers, as, as booking agents, like why? You know, like my thing is I feel like if the WWE doesn't watch what it does, eventually they're going to start walking in the footsteps of WCW. Yeah. Slowly. 
It's going to happen, though. I mean, I, I already see remnants of that in AEW. It's like, oh, we're going to hire new talent. We're going to hire all these acts that you've never seen unless you've seen the independent circuit and you're gonna see them all here and it's like okay well i see hall of famers and um recently fired wwe superstars on your show now what happened to all the other quote-unquote talent you know all that new blood to take out the current product that uh, I'm sorry that like Cody Rhodes and his two little butt buddies, the Young Bucks over there, don't like. Oh, and that includes Kenny Omega. They're all a-holes, in my opinion. It's like, you, you're trying to one-up your competition, but you're stealing from the competition. You're stealing from us, in other words. And I know our podcast is supposed to be anything wrestling, but sometimes I don't want to talk about the other products because it's like you're not as appealing. I'm not put to be entertained by you. I'm going to chime in for two seconds based on, based on that. Because I watched the clip where Matt Hardy made his debut over on AEW. And I know that they're, they're struggling with the same format that WWE has going right now with the empty arena, figuring that, that thing out. But God dang, was that a, just a boring ass segment. <laughs> it, like it, from a, from a cinematic, from a production standpoint, I just was not intrigued by it. And you've got that long shot on Matt, and he's just doing the cl- the, the teeth clacking. I'm like, dude, I I get your character; it's fine, but some cut to a different shot. <laughs> you see, and it's like they have all these individual wrestlers that they hired, but yet it's like, oh, we got Matt Hardy on AEW. We have Brody Lee, formerly known as Luke Harper, here. We have Hall of Famer. Diamond Dallas Page, Jake Roberts, Vicky Guerrero. Like, are you trying to be WWE light? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, okay, I get it. This company is here because, oh, they want to start a revolution. They want to, you know, be the better brand. Okay, well then, one, why don't you stop trying to compete with the WWE? And second, WWE, stop feeding into their BS. I don't care for the Wednesday Night Wars. I don't care for there being a competitiveness between brands. Because honestly, I don't want it to come down to like four years later, Vince McMahon or whoever is on AEW TV announcing the victory. (laughs) I know that's being uh, hockey, but I don't want to see that. AEW's been getting better ratings than NXT, though, hasn't it? Yeah, from what I've One week seen. it does, one week it doesn't. It's like a roller coaster. I mean, granted, NXT isn't where your star power is for WWE, so... And, that's what, and, that, and that brings up my point. It's like, okay, you realize that your competitors are winning. So what do you do? Oh, let's put Finn Balor back on NXT. Let, let, let's, let's have Charlotte like travel with her belt because she's the queen and she's going to bring ratings. You want to win? You want to do better? Do better. Do, your, <laughs> do better. Promote your show better. Get better writers. Get better producers. Get better bookers. And I'm going to jump in for a second. I will say this about NXT, something that I can really appreciate, is anytime when I'm watching any NXT content, it could be an NXT episode, it could be a takeover, it could be a whatever. Anytime when I'm watching it, I know for a fact that there is structure. I know for a fact that if I'm seeing a segment or a match or anything, that there is a purpose for it, that it's it has a payoff, it's going somewhere. I'm not just seeing it just because they have to fill in time. 
I think I mentioned to both of you, maybe together or maybe separately, I don't remember, where I told you guys, I noticed for a second, uh-oh, Io Shirai has been missing from TV programming. Is Triple H slipping? Is he forgetting who he has on his roster? Is the roster becoming too extensive? And then all of a sudden, Io Shirai comes back. She's in a ladder match. And now she's the number one contender for the NXT Women's Championship. And in my mind, it's like, that's how you bring somebody back after missing a few weeks of television. I just feel like Triple H really is on the pulse of what a wrestling product is supposed to be in 2020. And to, to, to contribute to that whole conversation of the Wednesday Night Wars, I honestly believe that WWE, in their mind, has it that if something worked before, it's going to work again. So many of their things become parodied of stuff that happened 20 years ago or less. For example, John Morrison's comeback, which was absolute garbage. He comes back and, oh, they put the dirt sheet together. And they had to slap on a chant. And they have to clap in between to, to market it. You have things like, just like you said, Kamish, the Wednesday Night Wars. We don't want to see that. We've seen that before. We don't want to see that. We, everybody should be focusing on their own product. I get it that Cody Rhodes, I will say it right now, Cody Rhodes is a hypocrite. That whole thing with applying that sledgehammer to the throne and him saying that had nothing to do with Triple H, that had nothing to do with WW. I don't know what you're talking about. That was just, it was originality at its best. Yeah, I'm sure. And, it, you know, in my mind, it's like this whole thing of, oh, there's this company, AEW, on, uh, you know, out there. Well, now we have to crush them. No, you don't have to crush them. Just focus on you. Focus on having a better TV program, and that will be the least of your concerns. You have... A... Yeah, if, you, if you do better, then it'll, it'll speak for itself. Exactly. They're, they're pouring their eggs into... Oh, well, 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 what do we do? How do we get AEW out of business? How do we do better? How do we beat them? Um, have a better TV program. That's it. And I know some people say, oh, well, you haven't been in the business. You don't know. No, I haven't been in the business, but I'm just going to toot my own horn here for a second. Even some of my or even our ideas is way better than what they have scripted. Eric Rowan walks around with the cage, and then the payoff is there's a rubber spider inside. Okay, sure, yeah, that that that's gonna spike the ratings. Sure. I want to I want to spin off that for one second and go with one more analogy. Uh, you don't have you don't have Walmart and Target actively focused on putting the other one out of business. They're more concerned about making the... In their situation, it's all about profit, but they're not concerned about putting the other out of business so much as just making as much money as they can. Yeah. So in a situation like this, don't worry about putting the other companies out of business. Put out your best product. Yeah. That's it. Focus on yourself. Better yourself. How are you going to love somebody else when you can't even love yourself? <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's led to a lot of frustration, and I think I've told you guys uh, to to get off the 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 product itself and to focus on the guy in charge, the old man. I've ha I have found myself resenting the guy as of recent. All this dark backstory that's coming to light about all the people whom he didn't help when they needed it the most, you know. Yes, you, you're supposed to have a good TV product. You're supposed to have good ratings. You're supposed to have Raw and SmackDown the best that it can be. But God damn it, you got to you gotta take care of your people. You got to take care of your children, essentially. Those performers, sometimes they go on a downward spiral or they're, they're in a moment in their life when they're not doing so good. Get them the help they need. You guys have a wellness program. And not to say that they haven't helped out a few people. Honorary mention Mike Canellis, who had a, a real problem with drinking. You know, they helped him out and they, you know, they got him into rehab and he's been doing better and God bless him. But I'm going to refer back to it for a second. Uh, Dark Side of the Ring, these documentaries that have been coming out, you have people like, the remains of Stevie Richards' family who say, yeah, when this whole thing went down, nobody offered a phone call, nobody offered to help. 
We were ignored. We were looked at as the people who are in fault and we were not to be associated with. And I'm, I'm, there, there was another example of someone else, um, Ashley Massaro. All the, everything that happened and it's like all Vince really ever cared about. All the WWE cares about is imaging. Oh, WWE and Fox, that's going to get the headline. WWE and Saudi Arabia, that's going to get the headline. The, with the rumor going around that Fox might be the ones to pick up WWE should Vince decide to sell, um, what I'll say is I know I know Fox is well known for their whole sports side, but they're also an inter- they also have an entertainment company within them. So I wouldn't be surprised if should Fox come to acquire WWE that we then see um, an influx of entertainment personnel being brought in to bolster it. Because I feel like Fox doesn't want to put out a a half-assed program, so they'll bring in people who know how to craft an actual story, and they'll say, great, people like Triple H can stick around because he's got a mind for it, but we're going to write your stories. Yeah. Yeah? I mean... I mean, I thought of that, and I thought of, like, all right, whoever the buyer is, obviously, they want to get money, but in the sense where, like, it makes sense, I mean, we don't know what their ideals are going to be in regards to talent and personnel and how they're going to take care of them. but you would think, like, oh, okay, if it is Fox, they are known for sports, so it's like, we're not going to just hire anybody i mean yeah you're gonna see how big and like obvious our logo is we haven't already on fox but smackdown but the thing that bugs me is just that like i feel like the old man has finally lost it in a sense where it's like you're, you're kind of like, like you said earlier, you're in that, I put in my two weeks notice, I really don't care mode. Yeah. And that makes you worry, like, when you do finally quit, like, who are you handing the keys to? Why are you all of a sudden not going to hand the keys off to remain of your family, you know? And to me, it's just like, well, to do you, are you doing this because you're hiding something that we don't know? Is it because all these things are being exposed slowly and something about you is going to come up? Like, what is it? And I, and that's where it kind of has me like, well, this is why, like, I can't really enjoy the product. Like, I can't even watch Raw and SmackDown lately. Not because I don't have access to it, but because it's like, uh, nothing's really entertaining. I'm just going to watch the highlights. Yeah, and not, to, not, to, not to say that some of the highlights haven't, haven't been pleasant enough. Like, there, I, there's a reason that I, I suggested that we post the, the response to Liv Morgan. She, she's doing really well. I, I, like seeing the gro- I like seeing the growth of these individuals um, because that's the, the heart of professional wrestling is you, you attach to specific performers and characters and you want to see them do well. <laughs> and she's one of the most recent ones. And I'm sure, sh- I'm sure there's others for each of us, but yeah, I, I, I but I feel you, I feel you on the whole, like oh, this one's good. That one's not. <laughs> I I'll, I'll even contribute to that as well i'll even say that watching a two minute highlight video sometimes is dreadful on its own because it uh-huh. once again falls back on that thing of is there is there a reason to watch this is there gonna be a payoff do they even care is there something solid in the books for this are they just did they just throw it on the wall and it stuck that night um yeah you know i i i told you guys as well that Liv morgan and ruby riot have been have been great in the ring Drew McIntyre, I think thus far, has been booked relatively solidly. Uh, could it be a bit better? Probably. But it's not bad. Um, but the problem is you have 30 minutes of content that you think is solid, content that is believable and that you enjoy, 
And then you have two and a half hours or, or two hours of filler, of pointless segments, of two storylines that get slapped into a tag team match. A superstar who appears one week and then they're gone for four weeks and then they come back again. I just, I don't understand it. I don't understand why we can't have better creative, why we can't have better stories. Um, I think that if they maybe broke their moral code of having everything scripted, having everything written out, as opposed to going, hey, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in right now because it just happened today. I was watching the untold um, episode on the net, on the WWE Network of Cactus Jack and Triple H's match from Royal Rumble 2000. And there are certain moments where you hear Mick Foley goes, yeah, you know, there was a moment where Vince McMahon came up to me and said, hey, I'm thinking about having you and Triple H participate in a program because Austin is gone. We need someone to have that main event status going on to to drive that main event momentum. What do you think of working with the guy? I feel like back then there was structure like that. Like, hey, I'm thinking about pairing you with so-and-so. Do you guys think you could come up with something? Those two guys would maybe go in a room or maybe in between flights or hotel rooms. They would be like, well, what could we do? Well, maybe we could do this. And then maybe we can go over here. Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. And it feels like now... Everything is in the hands of little old Joe over there, who I talked about 30 minutes ago, who thinks that he knows what's best, who thinks that just because he wrote for two soap operas not related to sports or wrestling, that he knows what's going to get over with the audience. And even when the audience tells you what they want, it, it takes a miracle for you to finally listen. Like you said, Dan, the whole thing with Daniel Bryan literally took a miracle, a movement, and consistent chanting for someone to get it through their thick old skull that this is who we want to see in our main event. Let's not mention Becky Lynch because, yeah, they gave us Becky Lynch, but we got a triple threat that was not needed or desired. And then this year we get an eight-minute match while the other uh, women's match gets 30 minutes. Really, really a crime. And what sucks now is that apparently Becky Lynch, I'm hearing all these things that apparently she's going to star in a Marvel Marvel movie that, you know, she's really starting to take on roles on the big screen. She's uh, She was a part of, I think, Billions, the, the TV show. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but yeah, she was apparently on the episode tonight. But do you guys realize, and did, and did this maybe cross your mind, that <laughs> Becky Lynch is not defending her title She's not really on TV right now. So right now you have a main event player. And yes, she is a main event player because she can go. You turn down the stove, Dan, like you said last time. You turn down the stove on her. And now it's almost like, let her stay on the side until we can figure out what to do. And that just boggles my mind. How could that be? You don't do that. You don't put your top championship, who's been your champion for a year at this point... Oh, she's she's doing a movie, she's doing this, she's doing that. Well, guess what? Wasn't Cena participating in small roles here and there and he was still a full-time competitor in the WWE? So why can't we have that with Becky? Why does she have to be on the sideline? She's your champion, for Christ's sake. You already botched both of her WrestleMania, top WrestleMania moments. Now you can't even let her ride the wave after WrestleMania? And and there's even a like we saw her in Marine Six. If if these trends keep going, there were, there was a couple of whispers that I read online that maybe she makes the jump, just like Cena and The Rock and probably Roman. You, you build up these big talents; they transcend your your um, mediocre uh, little company, and then they tinker off into the into the sunset. Becky went to school for acting. <laughs> you you want to try and tell me that if she was given the opportunity to, t- t- kind of like The Rock, to take less physical damage and still get paid more to act, she's not going to jump at the chance? Please. Obviously, growing up during the Attitude Era, 
my thoughts were, okay, The Rock isn't performing as much. He's doing movies and TV shows. Good for him. He's building his name, building his reputation. But he's still on the product. He's still there. And then he starts leaving, like, a lot. So he's on sporadic appearances. He'll be there on a mania, whatever, you know? And But yet, you still know who he is. You still love the guy. You know, whatever. So what do we get? You get this guy whose dream was to be a bodybuilder, but that failed. Wanted to be a rapper. That failed. So he applies his rap gimmick, or I guess like his passion, into wrestling. And out of nowhere... Vince McMahon sees, oh, he's drawing in the crowds that The Rock used to crowd, uh, draw in. You know what? I could do something with this to still make money. But what do I do that I didn't do with Hulk Hogan and The Rock? <gasps> I'll make them appeal to the children. Because if I get the children, the parents have to pour in the money. Right? Yeah. So I turn John Cena into the biggest PG product I can, and I finally succeeded where I didn't succeed with The Rock and Hulk Hogan. However, I did fail in the fact that he draws it in the crowd of young men and adults who boo him out of the building, but you can hear the kids and the girls screaming for him to stay. So you get this momentum going and going, and at the same time as you have John Cena on the rise, he starts grabbing a shovel. And he starts burying a lot of people in his path because, according to him, if they didn't have the it factor to carry on after the rivalry with him, he felt it was necessary to bury them. How do you know we would have gotten something better if you just gave them a chance, John? Vince, like, why did you have to listen to John Cena this whole time when you could have had, you know, just because John felt, oh, The Miz is going to do good with me and after me. Randy Orton's going to do good with me and after me. So let me get this straight. The Nexus wouldn't have done well. Wade Barrett wouldn't have done well. Sheamus did okay. So Sheamus went from being at the very top in the beginning of his career to now being a mid-carder. And now dealing with what? Who does he wrestle nowadays? Local competitors. Like, yeah. So you mean to tell me you're going to listen to everything John Cena says and not believe in the talent that you had? Because you had great talent all those John Cena years. And most of them decided, I'm going to go to TNA. I'm going to go to MMA. I'm going to go to UFC. Or I'm going to go do this, and then uh, let's bring it around to 2017 to now. Triple H convinces all those people that are still in the business to come back because John isn't there anymore, or he's hardly there. You have the ability to do so well with talent, but yet you don't realize it. You don't realize when you have lightning in a bottle. Because you have one person that is giving you everything you wanted in terms of money, and you have to listen to him. But you don't want to listen to the crowd. You don't want to listen to the fans. You don't want to listen to decent people you had writing for your job. And then you get Joe, the who, like you guys have said, barely knows a goddamn thing about wrestling. And is like, I think you should do this, Mr. McMahons. And it works. And it's like, no. It works because you think it works, but 90% of the demographics that you have watching your product are booing it out the door. Oh, but the things that are doing well, let me take them off TV. They want to go do other things. So what is Becky Lynch doing? She's doing TV. She's doing movies. And guess who's mentoring her right now? Dwayne and John. I get it. 
wrestling is not going to be forever for these people because they have to worry about their body. They want to keep going and making money. And the next best thing is obviously acting or hosting shit. I get it. But for the love of God, like with the lightning in a bottle you do have around, take advantage of it. Or if not, you're going to fire it. You're going to waste millions on it. Or you're just going to let it go to crap. And that kills me. Yeah, I'm going to uh, add this in there because it's the first thing that came to mind when talking about talent and creative ideas and them actually contributing as opposed to listening to you know, John, who might think a certain way about something. Chris Jericho has gone on record to say that that whole Festival of Friendship segment was his idea. And he had to fight tooth and nail with Triple H, the guy whom we praise so much. He had to fight tooth and nail, and Triple H said, no, that wouldn't be such a good segment. I don't think it's going to work. Let's not do it. And Jericho had to push and push and push until finally... He got the segment to to get greenlit. After that segment was over, Jericho says, I walked past Gorilla. First guy there, Triple H, who looked at me and said, that worked. That worked. And in my mind, it's, well, if you have all these veterans, let's face it, you have people like Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Ricochet, you know, all these guys who are still relatively young who can go And I can guarantee you, they've been in the business for a moment, for a second. I'm pretty sure that if you tell them, hey, we are looking for you to give us some really good ideas on on your next feud. If we partnered you up with so-and-so for the next two or three pay-per-views, can you come up with some good story, some good content, some good storytelling? Have those two go into a room and just talk it out. If you still want to add things or remove things or polish them up or tune it up, sure, go for it. But I think it almost seems like nowadays the talent gets no say. Something is written for them. Even people like Steve Austin have gone on record to say, I'll go and I'll do a special appearance. And I have, once again, I'm going to bring it. And I apologize for anybody's name who's Joe and happens to have a degree in writing. I'm not trying to bash you in. I'm just it just happens to be my my example that I'm using. You have people like Joe who would walk over to a Steve Austin and go, "Yeah, for your appearance tonight, uh this is your script." And Steve Austin has has gone on record to say, "I would literally take the script, crumple it up, crumple it up and I would throw it to the floor and go, "You don't hand Steve Austin a script. Steve Austin doesn't need a script." And I think that's the biggest problem is that once again, you have people like Becky Lynch and we're going to draw back to her. People like Becky Lynch who can talk, who can wrestle, who can be the most entertaining segment in the entire TV program. But then she gets watered down and the stove gets turned down and all these other elements come into play. We're not going to focus so much on Becky Lynch. We're going to focus more on how Charlotte comes into the equation. We're going to focus on how Ronda can be more of an a-hole of a heel to get the fans really rallied up. Oh, and guess what? For the ending of the match, it's going to look pretty botched and unplanned for. And it's not going to have that impact that needs to be had for Becky Lynch to have her 10, 12, 14 years of hard work culminate in the middle of that ring because she's earned it. I will for one second even go back to Rhea Ripley, someone whom I can say we've all fell in love with in regards to her wrestling, her performance fighting her way up the car, being the most important and intricate part of the show. There is such a thing as elevating your superstars when it matters. But once again, I've said it before, it seems like their philosophy is much like Vince, who quote-unquote is in an effort mode, screw trying to elevate talent, screw trying to see what, where the next star is, who, where, where is that next John Cena, where is that next Roman Reigns for our women's division? Screw all of that. Let's just, let's focus on the counting of someone's title reign. Let's try to get it up and past 16. So that tomorrow, the next day, on her website bio or in her future book, she can say, yeah, I surpassed my father's record. That, that, that's something, right? Are you proud? Are you proud of me, daddy? 
I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's it, it, I I get it. Running people have gone on record to say sure. running running wrestling running Monday Night Raw is not easy. There are so many people that are a part of the production. I understand that, and I can respect that. Someone who's trying to get into the film business, I understand that. But when you have simple things that's right in front of you, and all you have to do is pull the trigger, for whatever reason, they'll, they'll either not go with it, or if they do go with it, we're going to add some elements, we're going to stir things up, we're going to take something in its original form that could work, and we're going to manipulate it just so that it fits with everything else that seems to be mediocre and dull and non-interesting. Yeah, it's, no, it's non-committal behavior. I don't know. I apologize. It seems like I'm going on rant after rant after rant. But literally, just thinking about the product, there is so many missed windows. There's so many missed opportunities that list of 15 or 20 producers, well, not so much the producers, but the wrestlers that you all released, the Sarah Logans, the Heath Slaters, the Rusevs, the Ember Moons who all got released. You mean to tell me you couldn't find talent in any of those performers, let alone everybody else who was a part of that list? I can guarantee you all those people had you just allowed them for them to be them, for them to be authentic, would have made your company a whole lot more money than you were trying to give them credit for. Can I just throw something in? Please. If you felt the need to really destroy your competition around you and you had to steal talent to only bury them later on in WWE or fire them recently, why did you sign them in the first place? Like, honestly. Like, I, I mean... You want me to answer outside your question? Of, outside of hoarding, hoarding them away from other companies. <laughs> exactly. No, I get that's it. it. But that, that, that's my point. Like, you know you have talent. Why do you have to sign more to eventually get rid of? You know? Like, it just sucks. Like, let's be real. Like, has Shinsuke had the greatest run of all time? No, not at no. all. Not even close. Not even <laughs> scratch the surface. Is a has AJ been more memorable in the WWE or everything he's done before this? I can't say because I haven't seen his career before, so I, I can't say that one. Yeah, that one's tough. I I, 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 would, I would say AJ himself uh, has probably made a bigger name for himself here than he has uh, than he has anywhere else. But he's probably put out better work everywhere else. Sounds about right. Okay, here's another. Here's another one. Sting. Sting deserved better. That one, there's a little bit of circumstance because of the injury. But let's face it, even before the injury, it wasn't the best booking. But, eh. Samoa Joe. Oh no, no. Uh, yeah, Joe's Joe's been a mess. Yeah. <laughs> He was, I want to say he was solid in NXT, but main roster, it's it's been a mess. Good commentator, I will say that. Good commentator, but... That's the only good thing I have about him, brother. If he, if injury-wise, he's done, please, please put him on the Raw team. Get rid of Byron. I would literally have a show if it's Joe, uh, Todd, and uh, the King. Yeah. Oh, hell, just Joe and Todd. He blends in very naturally when he's on the commentary table. Myron Saxon yeah. kills me. Joe's, Joe's, got, Joe's got charisma. He just hasn't gotten to really show it. And that's what I mean. It's like all these people that we've known or at least heard their name everywhere else, as soon as they get to WWE... I mean, I mean, there's a reason Joe was a staple in TNA. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> That's it. He he knows what he's doing. He's a good performer and he's charismatic. He just hasn't gotten. He just hasn't gotten to really show off any of that since he came over. But I'm sure his pockets were nice and lined. That sounds about 95% of the roster right now. 
And, I, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't blame these guys for coming over to get the WWE money. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I don't fault anybody for saying, you know, I've been in Impact for 12 years. Maybe it's about time I uh, look out for myself. Yeah, if some people are there to just collect a paycheck, that's fair. I can't really say any names because I don't know whose philosophy that really belongs to. But it seems like more than not, you have superstars who are actually complaining and going, no, I don't want to be in catering. I don't want to be backstage. I want to be the best of myself as a performer that I could possibly be. I even, I've seen it so many places, Rhino, you know, to name a few, has said that, you know, they're offering me a lot of money. I don't want it because I don't want to be sitting home and just collecting a paycheck. I want to contribute to the business. I want to give back to the business that the business has given to me. Yeah. You know, so many other people out there um, who fail to come to mind right now, but everybody. You have people like, you know, Rusev or other people through Instagram or even um, Liv Morgan at one point. I forget what it was where she put out a tweet that said, I wanted it, I wanted it, I wanted it. So many of these performers telling you that I I want to be the best of myself that I could possibly be. And if the people in charge don't think that those people have that flame inside to be the best that they can be, that's fine. But you need to let them go. Or if you are willing to give them a chance, like I said, one suggestion for me was maybe cut back a million or two from those Saudi things that you do. Maybe cut off another million or two from a failed XFL attempt again. And actually put your investment towards maybe a new show. Kind of make like a, you can even call it a proving grounds or, or, or whatever. And allow for the talent who's not getting a lot of airtime to go on that program and tell them, hey, your challenge is to, is to stand out. Do something different. Elevate yourself. Change something. Get somebody's attention. Get the people talking. Get the people trending. That's what you need to do. Um, and I think that would be one way of elevating your talent. Because, again, if you don't, don't want to bank on them, if you don't want to give them a chance, let them go. But let me rephrase by saying don't let them go in the middle of a pandemic. That's it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the same thing that, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go too far into this uh, and, and talk about it from a political standpoint or anything. But it's it's the same thing with these other companies where you've got the the top echelon of, of people who keep making all the money, and yet you've got all the underlings who are the ones who suffer. And it's the same thing with the. Uh, I can't so much say Drake Maverick per se, but the Drake Mavericks, the Kurt Hawkinses, the Zack Ryders, the Sarah Logans. I don't know. It's personally for me, it's a bit of a sensitive subject, and that's just it's it's coming from a place of love. It really, really is. I want WWE to be the best that it could possibly be, and of course, I'm not saying that in a major businesses like this, you're gonna have mis- you're you know you're not gonna have mistakes. You're not gonna have shortcomings. You are obviously, everybody screws yeah. up at some point. Even WWE has admitted that you know what we didn't push so and so. That was a big mistake. We're going to try to right that wrong. Or so-and-so had a return years ago. It didn't work out. We're going to try to fix it. We're going to try to make amends. And they do most of the time. So I'm not saying that they need to be this 100% non-flawed company. But it just seems like, again, they, they, it seems like they don't care, really. It's like, forget giving the fans what they want. Forget giving the talent an opportunity Let's stick to a blend of tradition, something that's worked at least once before, and just winging it on most things. And that'll hopefully get us through another week of weekly programming. Um, so yeah, I can just... One thing that I wanted to ask you guys, with all this said, if you were feeling like if WWE was telling you we are looking for uh, surveys from our most passionate WWE fans. We want you to tell us 
what we can do to make the product better. What's priority number one for us to fix or make or, or tune or, or make better? What would you guys say on that survey? What would be the first thing on your priority list of trying to make better? Uh, develop, developing, uh, developing the stories. I just think that they've been lazy about it for a long time, and and they don't, they don't put out quality stories. Agreed, Kamish. Get rid of your booking, creative, and writing teams completely, and start fresh. And have Triple H hire everybody on those three teams. Because the way his mindset is for NXT, I'm pretty sure if you gave him the ability to do it for the main two shows, we would be somewhere better. Agreed. Um, My answer falls into basically that is just better storylines that come at that that comes at the expense of superstars allowed to be a better version of themselves. Before I close this thing off, do we have do you guys have anything else that you want to get off your chest? This is your moment if you want to speak as a WWE fan who's been following the product. Anything you guys want to add? I think I said everything I had to say. To be honest, I, I'll just chime in and say that I want. I like you said. I want WWE to be the best that they can. I have a I have a, a long long relationship with them at this point. I I want to see them be successful, but I also want to feel like I'm not being. Uh, I, I think you you kind of said it. I I don't want to feel disrespected by their their decisions. Yeah. Feel the pulse listen to your audience and do right by them. They're like, it, it, cause you also owe it to your performers. Like for, uh, people have started to get behind, behind a drew. People got behind Becky. People got behind Brian. And if, if you had, like I said, if you hadn't given Brian that moment at, at 30, um, it would have gone down in history as one of the worst WrestleManias and one of the worst decisions by WWE ever. Yeah. Because we love him. He's the type of person that we want to support and that we relate to. And that's why we watch. So if they if they if they don't want to focus on that, if they don't want to do right by the, the fans and their, their workers, sell the goddamn company. <laughs> yeah. Um I've said it before, that in eras like the new generation, the Attitude Era, the Hulkamania Era, the Ruthless Aggression Era, I'm pretty sure they would be chomping at the bit to have a platform where the fans could express how they're feeling about the product. And in today's day and age, in today's technology, you have more than one way. You have social media all over the place, and you have fans telling you always how they feel about the product. And they say, oh, we're always listening. We're always listening to the fans. More like one out of ten scenarios you're listening to the fans. For every Give Divas a chance that they listen to, they'll listen to us say, no, we don't want Kurt Angle facing off against the Baron Corbin. No, we don't want this, we don't want that. Yet you consistently go through with your ideas thinking that, oh, they'll like it eventually. So in my mind, it's if you have the platform for people to speak to you and review your product, and granted, you're not going to be able to satisfy every single person, but when you have a majority of people who get behind a certain someone, a certain angle, a certain you know storyline, that almost becomes your cue to pull the trigger. I'm going to leave it at that. So with all that, and I know that was very much a mouthful for all of us, uh, we just gave our thoughts, not as analysts, not as the guys in the gimmick, as long-time real wrestling fans. We just gave our thoughts on what we think about the product, what we would like to see implemented. Let us know in the comment section below how you guys feel. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Would you add anything? 
Do you feel differently about something? And that about does it for this episode. So again, everybody, during times like this, stay home, stay safe, and we will catch you all next time.